going, y'all? Isaiah Grant, we're back with another episode of Thinking in Circles. Um, basically, what we're going to do is, I promise, we're going to go straight into another episode, and it's basically on the uh, idea that Jordan Peterson was talking about uh, in one of his lectures that I found very uh, important and very informative, especially uh, as uh, I used it a little bit uh, with the idea of the triune brain theory and also as I used it with my knowledge of the left and right brain hemisphere qualities to help me in my endeavor uh, with that MMA fight that I did and that social experiment. So uh, uh, there was a lot that I was able to gain out of that. So what I basically did was <clears throat> uh, yesterday I sat down and uh, or maybe I think it was day before yesterday I was sitting down and I was uh, looking over that uh, that idea of Jordan Peterson. I, I think it's I think it's personally his. I haven't personally been able to find out uh, the video series that he had that idea in, but nevertheless, it's a tool that I've that I I have personally used and that uh, has worked for me. And um, once again, I'm the type of individual that likes to to pair certain ideas up that juxtapose with one another. I am a syncretist at heart. I see the power in linking tools to other tools to to make the dream work at the end of the day. So um, the idea is freeze, emotionalize, imagine, explore, divide, master. Um, what I've come to find is that the way that outer stimulus uh, or stimuli come in, uh, things that you're dealing with, uh, let, let, let's say something happens that causes you mentally to go off and you, you stop, you have a freeze response. I mean, that, that's something that's regulated by the amygdala, of course. And um, what ends up happening is that after that freeze response, you have an emotional situation that goes off per this idea. And um, you're, I, you know, you, you, you get to asking yourself, I guess, you know, if you like it or not, also to their their memories that come in that are associated with the whole situation that deals with the hippo, hippocampus region of the brain. You are thinking of how to after that in in the imagine portion of of the idea. You're you're basically seeing how you can approach the situation, and then you explore that idea pretty quickly. You divide, being it, maybe it's fight, maybe you fight, maybe you go for the situation, or you flight, you leave the situation alone now. Then after, and that's divide, and then there's master, which is actually executing the tasks as you've computed them in your mental computer, all right? Now, with this whole uh, series of ideas, I mean, if you think real time, it's like there's some situations that you don't really have all that time to think about uh, that require just the amygdala's fast response, but it is a pretty realistic to me at least because I've, I've used this idea watching animals. I've used this idea uh, and kind of pattern certain certain behaviors off of it, and it's it's uh, it's, it's it's pretty it's pretty to the point and linear as far as how things proceed from one step to another across the board it pretty much goes from point a to point b as far as the idea is concerned and when you have something like that that means that there's some archetypal motif that's underlying this idea that makes it apply to so many different things at once and while i was sitting around thinking about this idea and uh thinking about how how it uh lined up with the uh, triune brain situation, left right brain theories of uh, capabilities of those centers within the mind. And uh, while I was also thinking about uh, some symbolic motifs that fit with that, I uh, was, you know, by a spark of intuition, brought to think about the story of Zeus swallowing Metis, who was pregnant with Athena at that time during the uh, uh, during that that mythological story and I came into some really amazing findings that I'd like to share 
in this lecture series and uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are going to enjoy it here. Um, and before I get started, uh, if you like these videos, please like them. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. If uh, you like them, please also share them on some platforms that you know that uh, other individuals may benefit from them. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this diagram that I put together that I will be putting on the screen during this lecture. And uh, this should be a pretty fast one because uh, I, I only, you know, wrote, I, I really try to condense the material, wrote only a few pages on it though. But the way that I'm going to approach this lecture is uh, basically by telling you something from my short notes and then telling you something from the longer notes to kind of encompass it. The longer notes are, are really comprehensively written down, so it shouldn't be so cumbersome. So when all is said and done, this diagram basically um, within the idea of, the, and, I, and I, I abbreviated, I say F-E-I-E-D-M, so I don't have to say freeze, emotionalize, imagine, explore, divide, and master every dang time, okay? so. Within this F-E-I-E-D-M idea, the triune, I'll show you how the triune brain fits into that in a linear, in a linear setting. I also uh, put the hemispheres right and left brain in the appropriate positions here in a linear fashion. Um, I threw up something that involved other mythological characters that correspond to this, and, and that's really pretty cool to get into because if you've listened to some of my la my uh, earlier lectures, I talked about the myth of Medusa, Perseus, Pegasus, um, and uh, I, I put some of those characters in there in a linear fashion in order to see to show you how, in a syncretic way, all of this kind of flows together. Okay. Um, so also too, I put the, the ideas of the characters that we're going to be talking about, particularly in this series, how those go on this idea of F-E-I-E-D-M in a linear setting. Also, I, I, by another flash of insight, I saw how the diamond archetype of Carl Gustav Jung fell into play in this idea. So I put the the uh, main levels of that diagram into this diagram. That way, if anybody uh, is, is aware of it that's watching this, they can uh, refer to their knowledge of the diamond archetype of the self and get something from this as well, though, too. Now, uh, something that might be kind of cool for you guys to understand when dealing with the triune brain idea, the top of the head deals with the 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 m the lat that m portion which is master right the amygdala deals with freeze so it's freeze emotionalize imagine explore divide master from the from the spine up so i mean this is like a, a pr really pretty cool system and these are just some of the correspondences that i threw up here you also have um, since it's divided into right brain, left brain, and a lot of this just perfectly aligns. Uh, you have also lunar uh, uh, ideas that go into it and also solar ideas that go into it. So uh, some some situations may have kind of more of a, a logoic theme to them, which is uh, uh, animus, and then some may have more of an eros theme, which is anima. So for those that... that have put together uh, an understanding of that based upon past lectures that I've talked about and getting directly into this once again um, I also had to, to come back to this because from the last video that I put out where uh, where I did that MMA fight and uh, as, as a social experiment and was putting together um, put myself in a real bad situation, uh, uh, stress-wise, you know, on, on many different levels, just to see how a lot of those levels in the, uh, uh, from the triune brain theory, you know, from understanding it from that standpoint, what those were giving me and, and, and uh, uh, got a lot from it. Basically, what, what I did was I said, you know, I gotta come back and revisit this and uh, uh, give you guys just a little bit more info on 
how I also saw that this story of of uh, Zeus's swallowing of Metis while she was pregnant with Athena came into play in this. So I'm gonna be throwing this diagram up on the screen. You'll be able to see it. Hopefully you'll be able to, to follow along with it and, and, and start to put an understanding together of, of what I'm talking about with these things. Um, hopefully you were able to, uh, from all the past videos I've been talking about, the triune brain theory and tying it in with left and right brain theory and also tying it in with uh, ideas from analytic psychology. Hopefully you've been able to see how these things juxtapose. And with the juxtaposition, the way I look at it as is, is this, is the more systems that you have, it's kind of like building a, some type of a lattice framework, let's say a net, right? The more systems that you have that go side by side with other systems and coincide you're basically building a net by which you can, and I've never, I never did this when I was younger, nor did I do it when I was older, but I used to see people with nets trying to catch uh, certain bugs, specimens of bugs, and I guess they had bug collections or whatever, but this is a way that you can catch certain ideas and nothing, not much will get really, will, will get by you uh, uh, if you have a tight lattice network of different systems that you can turn around and apprehend things and see things by. So, and and, and, and that, that gets into apprehending things by intuition as well, though, too. All right. And gets into uh, sometimes some, some very, very, very amazing uh, insights that come from uh, uh, consistently working out that intuitive center within yourself as well, though, too. You, you start seeing that, that, uh, uh, it starts popping into your life and uh, every now and then and you're able to make um, some pretty wise next moves based upon, oh man, I got a premonition about this or dang, I saw this coming. You know what I'm saying? So, but anyways, you know, and then that, and that also comes from the amygdala center, you know, that's why it's really important to know what's going on up here, you know? So uh, without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be throwing up this um, chart onto the screen, and I'm also going to, to refresh our memories, throw up left and right brain, uh, right hemisphere correspondence list so you can basically see how this fits into this, uh, 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 this whole situation, basically how these things are lined up pretty linearly. You you you'll actually see that if you're paying if you've been paying attention to the past lectures or if you know anything about this stuff have prior knowledge about these things you're gonna see like oh that does make sense this is really some linear thought here you know um, so anyways now we're talk we're gonna talk about what you're gonna see on your screen um, in the almost on all the way on the bottom column, one up from where you're gonna read rotundus, rotundum lapis serpentis inferior, inferioris hominis and superior homo. Above that, you're gonna see Athena, Metis, Zeus, Athena, linear, okay? And you'll, you'll see how what I'm talking about is gonna correspond to what else is in these charts as well. So, okay. so. I'm going to give you an overview here. Zeus, basically, in this myth, and this corresponds once again to this F-E-I-E-D-M situation. Zeus basically takes on a devouring mother type aspect by swallowing Metis, who is the goddess of wisdom, skill, craft, okay? And he shapeshifts to catch her. Um, and that shape shifting mirrors how the mind changes in so many ways in the face of certain stimuli or stimulus, right? Okay. So uh, um, this this is is going in a linear fashion with the the freeze, emotionalize, imagine. We're at about imagine in this situation as I'm reading now. Okay. So he embodies uh, Metis's wisdom then. And from a division in his head crafted by the axe of Hephaestus, remember the fire of Prometheus was stolen from the forge of Hephaestus in uh, Mount Olympus, okay? Athena 
basically was spring spring from the division in his head that was crafted by Hephaestus. And uh, uh, let me see. She was the goddess of intelligence and wisdom, handicraft, heroism, courage, war, strategy, industry, and cities. This one myth is the perfect emblem of the whole F-E-I-E-D-M process. Athena's animals are the owl, serpent. Now, before I go and read the rest of them, the owl and the serpent, the owl being a bird, all, all birds to a great degree okay they're they're not mammalian they're not they're 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 more reptilian than anything else you know and even in the Rosarium philosophorum they use the bird to show the aspect the goading aspect of the spirit which is representative of libido as well though too okay and you'll see some further things in her list of animal descriptions you have the spider the spider is akin to the egyptian god nith and uh so is athena and uh, the spider got there because Athena basically turned this one woman that got into a weaving contest with her, and uh, it, it was it was uh, a mortal, so it became a, a situation of hybris against the gods. So that that's ego inflation basically, and uh, she turned her into a spider. You know what I'm saying? She couldn't beat uh, Athena's skills, so she got turned into a spider. So. That's one of her creatures, and um, it, it, it talks about how things are spun in some ways on the spindle of fate, you know, um, as, as far as Athena is concerned, right? And also the horse, because if you think about the horse, the horse, um, and you can look into uh, the book Psychology of the Unconscious by uh, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, where he talks about the symbolism of the horse. It's uh, representative of the feminine in the psyche, right? Uh, so that could be the anima. And it's also uh, a symbol of libido at the same time as well, though, too. And libido takes you through this whole F-E-I-E-D-M uh, uh, process, all right? So by these attributes, libido is intimated and the process is how, this process is how it unfolds. Athena is the one that created Medusa, as if problems, chaos are manufactured in order for us to grow wiser, as if wisdom exists because of the polar tension of chaos and wisdom as well too, and vice versa, you know what I mean? It's like almost as if one exists for the other, uh, uh, for the sake of the other and also for the sake of the individual that it, that is under the direct impression of the energies of these things so that they can be enriched and grow into something stronger by going through the consistent chain of back and forth events, you know, where we're, we're constantly getting uploads, we're constantly going through a, a spiral in life, going up to a point and then also going back down and around. It's like uh, the whole idea with or Ouroboros the serpent that is swallowing uh, uh, his own tail and he's in a, a, a circular uh, fashion doing this, okay? Um, and that's another reason why I put the diamond archetype here because um, you have Rotunda, Lapis, Serpentis, Inferioris, Hominis, and then you have Superior Homo. And the superior man goes around like that whole line of words I just said, the superior man makes a circle with the rotundum and he becomes the anthropus rotundus so or or, or the uh, around man the whole man the complete man you know and it's going through this whole cycle that makes you a complete person especially and only really if you're doing it consciously all right so that's what this is about increasing consciousness so um continuing forward uh i also wrote a side note here about this um a alias Aristides connected Athena's name to the four elements in unity. Okay, and when when uh, uh, you get into uh, Carl Gustav, Gustav Jung's writing, when he talks about the circle and completion and wholeness, and talks about mandalas, uh, sometimes he shows them uh, like a circle with a cross in the middle, and you know the mandalas, the way that they're sectored off that way as well though too in their circular motifs right and uh how the, those four 
uh, spaces in the circle represent thinking, feeling, sensation, intuition, fire, air, water, earth, uh, the four elements, etc., etc., etc. It's a, a, an idea of wholeness. So we can say then that Athena in a large way is related to wholeness and completeness. And she definitely is. Um, and so, so is so, so so it is too when you're trying to master a situation. That's you're, you're trying to come and bring it to a completion, right? So Anyways, she is said to be one who has the mind of God, which is noose. And uh, if you recall some of my past lectures, I talked about noose. And noose is a, a serpent that relays the symbolic messages of the self to man, who is a symbol as well, though, too. And the way that that communication occurs is that man has the right doctrine. Remember Mercurius, uh, Tehuti, Thoth, etc., right? Uh, Hermes is at once a deity, but is also at once a philosophy as well, though, too. When you have the right philosophy, the uh, magnet of the philosophers is going gonna, is, is gonna to start working. All right. So anyways, I'm going to continue reading here. So let me see. Zeus is God of justice, order, and also represents the ego in its identification of I or self, which is false. Because of an oracle of Gaia, Earth, who prophesied that Meta's first child would be a girl, but the second child would overthrow Zeus, he, out of self-preservation, which is an amygdala function, swallows Metis, which is a Saturnian thing, if we can recall that Saturn slash Cronus did so, do to the same type of prophecy. This act made Zeus par equal in this act to devour to the devouring mother. You know, it, it, it's a maladaptation and a malintegration of the mother side. And the thing is, is, is you have uh, uh, individuals that are today, now today are suffering under aspects of the, the devouring mother archetype within their psyche because of their relationship and their um, inability and their lack of willpower to sever themselves from uh, a, a lot of infantile incest uh, um, incest fantasies basically that 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 are going on up here and that that's more on a psychological level it's not like they really want to do something to their mother but they're they're unequally yoked with her at the age and, and and with that idea and image of her at the age that they are in at this present time and moment, okay? It's pro probably some people you know like that. Okay, so anyways, let's continue. Zeus is said to be water and father, and this is in the Kabbalah, uh, the idea of the Kabbalists, all right? Water is a mother aspect in the in, in the Kabbalah, okay? Um, and, and, and also in other forms of esotericism, and we can look into esotericism as uh, uh, for symbolic ideas as they relate to the psyche, okay? Um, the mother or water is three, okay? The number three deals with that. Three leads to four. And uh, let's see. Three in Kabbalah is Saturn and is also the mother Bina, which is water, that represents water, which leads to four in that system, which is L or Zeus slash Jupiter, all right? So without further ado, I'm going to get into the actual paper paper. And and this paper that I just read right here is kind of like a little overview. I, I tell you what I'm gonna tell you and then I'm gonna tell it to you again and tell it to you again until you can totally understand what it is that I'm saying, you know? And uh, uh, that that's basically how I learn sometimes is through repetition, it, it, it uh, concretes itself. Uh, uh, in, 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 into in, into my mind in such a way that I'm able to uh, to, to remember, and um, that may actually be a limbic brain thing because the limbic brain deals with habit, and it's possible that habit gets stored into the more right brain center, and it's funneled back into the left in a way that you can 
have it and use it as a better tool later on, you know, and I see how that happens uh, with my training and with uh, uh, other things that I do. I usually tend to find other things and things a little bit down the line, like it, it, it comes out of the blue, but it's like it's it's based on something old. And that's what people, are, I guess, are calling downloads nowadays. Oh, too, I got a download. It's like, no, it, yes, it is a download from the right brain, from the unconscious, but it's based on something that you got a, a grain of, you know. Anyways, though, an in-depth analysis of how the story of Zeus, Metis, and Athena link with the triune brain theory dynamics. Zeus, based upon self-preservation, who is the ego or perceptive center or that which calls itself I, which is a balancing decision-making and active reactive center, becomes emotional. For example, the opposite of rational and undergoes a feeling of imbalance, the opposite of his said characteristics. You know, he's the god of justice. He's the god of order. He's the king of the gods. So he he unduly and unjustly took on the mother archetype. Watch this. So by doing so, uh, um, he becomes by all means, uh, by, by, by taking this on, okay? So he, he undergoes a feeling of imbalance, the opposite of his said characteristics, becoming by all means anima, via, me, via metis, okay? Anima possessed. This gives him wisdom having swallowed metis and right, possibly like he never felt he had before. Don't we all feel this way during amygdala hijack? or during inflation of ego. Animus slash animus possession is, is what that is, all right? Also, the devouring aspect seems to be genetic, genetically coded in him due to childhood trauma, possibly remembering unconsciously being in his father's belly for the same reason as the ill he commits in this story, you know? Um, and, and when all is said and done, I mean that 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 that's a part of his story is that he was in he was he was swallowed, uh, his his relatives were swallowed. I don't know if he was actually swallowed. No, he was not. I take that back. But his family members were swallowed. Think about that. You know. So you see you you see your your father doing something to your siblings. And then you go and do it to somebody else, you know, uh, uh, that, that that's happened in a whole lot of our lives. We learn the mistakes of our fathers and we and we take those mistakes and continue to do them, you know, and um, it, it, it just shows how infantile we could be and, and, and how much learning we have actually left to accomplish for ourselves. So I'm going to continue. I'm glad I actually caught that uh, that mistake right there. Because I, I don't, I don't want to be throwing out a, a, a gang of misinformation on this page. I really want people to be in, in, uh, truly enriched in this situation. So anyways, uh, 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 where were we? Based upon his past prototype, Cronus slash Saturn as king of gods, as we have seen, uh, plain to see, this is all much too... Uh, this is all too much reminiscent of the devouring mother archetype, which is chaos itself. This aforementioned shows Zeus in this state to have become dual sex split within himself. For this is not a proper integration of wisdom or the anima for that matter, but the beginning of an ordeal for Zeus who has identified himself now as or with chaos or the devouring mother, almost as if he steps backwards, waywardly into the sins of the fathers, what we were just talking about earlier, right? And what I mean, the sins of the fathers is like uh, uh, how it talks about in the Bible, for instance, right? How God's talking about how he's a jealous God and how he will visit the sins of the fathers upon the sons, upon the umpteenth generation of them that hate him, right? And um, that is very much so true because through the superego that we inherit and through uh, uh, certain aspects of the DNA that may link even to that, what ends up happening is like uh, there, there are parts of our conscience that uh, will, will just be like, oh, well, this is a, a right and good thing to do.
You know what I mean? Especially uh, when it comes to things that are, uh, you know, we could probably get in, in some real big trouble for. For uh, I'm pretty sure you and I both know of certain families that uh, have had terrible examples within their family tree uh, that possibly they knew and then some of them that they didn't even know. But it's just like, yeah, man, they come from a rough family and this this, this is what they do in that family. You know what I mean? And, uh, the, you know, there, there are a few good ones in the bunch, but there, there, there's something there in that bloodline and, and lineage that tends to do certain things that are in the DNA that uh, a, a lot of times, basically, I, I think that we're carrying the old baggage from, you know, people before us, people that have come before us, fathers. Um, I, I know that there are certain things that uh, uh, I, I've had to face, that I do face, that I, I have to um, be vigilant about that proceed from, you know, uh, 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 mistakes that my dad made. I'm pretty sure my son will uh, and, and hopefully I diminish as many of these things as I can. But, you know, I'm pretty sure that, that there's some traits and characteristics and things that my son will do based upon things that I did. You know what I mean? And and that, that's what, what this whole idea uh, comes in. But anyways, um, so the headache for Zeus, we can conjecture, is a large symptom of what can be linked in humans and animals to the freeze response. Also, depression, which can be the cause of migraines, headaches, and we can take this even as a metaphor of the terrible learning exp of a terrible learning experience, a very hard time brought on by depression, fear, or conflict, which causes one to freeze in terror, which the amygdala center usually bids us to do, pending the next steps. Snakes now are a creature of Athena, a reptile which was bound up with her mother, Metis, who was pregnant and whom Zeus swallowed. Now, I wrote a little footnote. This is definitely an allusion to the prima materia being found in the depths of chaos as Athena in the form of the prima materia uh, uh, is found in, a, in obscurity, in, in the depths of her mother locked deep inside of Zeus in the head of Zeus and remember how I was telling you about the rotundum anthropus the rotundum is, is is something that's deep at the bottom of a whale uh, 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 the anthropos in the um, the diamond archetype of the self is in the head and the head is linked in in Carl Jung's system to the tail okay so you can see if, if you picked up everything I was laying down right there you'll see how that makes sense right there so anyways let's continue Metis is the goddess of wise counsel, so she is a definite, definitely a chief anima figure or a perfect emblem of the anima. And keep in mind that Metis freed Zeus's siblings prior, uh, Zeus's siblings when he was younger. Prior to this act, he committed upon her. She saved his siblings from the devouring belly of his father, Cronus, by supplying him with a drug to slip Cronus that enabled that to happen. Almost as if anima possession, malintegration of the anima is a quote unquote sin. And now don't don't get turned off on me by using the word sin. Understand what the idea of sin is. It's it, uh, it's almost as if mal 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 malintegration of the anima is a sin against your own soul, meaning the reparation for the sin or whatever you know the uh, making it right teaches you a conscious increasing lesson about the soul in the end. You gotta you gotta mess up in order to learn. You know what I mean? And, that, and that's what sin is. Like, you know, it's, oh, you're going to hell. No, well, you're going to go through hell and you're going to learn something great while you're going through it. You know what I'm saying? That's basically what that is. So uh, animal possession sure can feel that way after you are forced to clean up after the outbursts, after one of those possessions. Think about some of the times that uh, you've had a, a swelling feeling coming over you and you've yelled at somebody and gone flat, flew off the handle, and then you went back and it was like, man, dude, I wish I hadn't said those things. You had to eat crow and apologize the day afterwards. You know what I'm saying? And the person tells you, go screw yourself, and, and they, they haven't talked to you since, you know? 
you know that, that that's animal possession you know and it, and, and and it points to the fact that you're not in control of your emotions you 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 still have some growing to do we all do we all fall short at some point so this divided uh okay so, so try to follow me here on this one now all right try to follow me here on this one now because this is going to be really important and I, like i said i'm going to keep throwing this uh uh this um this chart up here that way you can kind of use it to understand and juxtapose things while i'm talking anyways so this the, this divided zeus tricks the pregnant metis who is like the emotional limbic center being swallowed by the rational neocortex the limbic mother okay metis the limbic mother metis and look at that chart contains the serpentine amygdala attributed to athena within her as a child so we see all the layers of the brain here zeus representing the outer neo neocortex all right metis representing the limbic system which is inside of zeus and athena being the amygdala inside of metis like an intricate russian doll or onion with three layers if you will I might I might just draw draw this real quick that way you can see what I'm talking about on this portion. I think a, a visual representation would make sense. So the motif of this myth easily lays out the foundation for the structure and theory of the brain. Also, it gives the triune brain model a mythical facelift and method by which one can analyze its depths. Up to this point in the myth too, with the freeze. The swallowing, um, or let me see, where is that star? So I put a star next to Metis up there. I didn't want to stop because I wanted you to, to, to get up to here. So we're going to start at where it says up to this point in this myth, too. We're going to talk about where Freeze is developed, the idea for the F, okay? Um, but this star by Metis, I want to talk about this. Um, one of the symbols of Metis is a jar, which is a container which is a mother object, and that is an anima object, okay? It, it represents the anima. Also, the other symbol of Metis is a tree. The tree is a mother symbol also, linked with society and cities and social connections. This easily links her to the limbic system. Her tree is the walnut, which resembles the brain. When you crack a walnut open, it looks like a brain. Plato makes, uh, uh, and there's another side note too, Plato makes creative ingenuity Poros, the son of Metis. So like, I guess that would be her second child. So creative ingenuity, what's that? Imagination. That's what can help you defeat or overcome, if you will, the, the problems, if you will, that Zeus is going through in this story here, okay? So and that's something to keep on the tip of your brain, because in our society that is so left brain, we get away from the right brain faculties, if you will. We get away from uh, um, the, if you will, neocortical qualities and um, these qualities, as, as, as you can see, that are uh, um, a little bit of a mixture. I think it was of uh, the thalamus and the neocortical uh, um, centers, you know, as far as uh, uh, imagination is concerned. Hopefully I got that right. I, I just did it off the top of my head there. So, um, so let's get back to Freeze, all right? Freeze, uh, up to this point in this myth, too, with Freeze, the swallowing or devouring aspect of stimuli um, is that with emotionalize the imprisoning slash swallowing and embodying of a feminine slash emotional characteristics unduly with imagine the swallowing and embodying of the anima figure unduly with the child that is salvatory that is to spring forth from the womb of chaos as light which vanquish it with which vanquishes the negredo or depression and, and that light would be the albedo in alchemy but not until the doctor arrives with the cure okay so we're gonna get to that portion zeus orders someone after inner examination to cleave his head open with a double-headed axe 
and it was called the Minoan Acts. And I wrote here on a side note, personal note, because I was going to go back over this and really, really just deep dive on that and, and eat it up myself, but I, I like to share. So um, Proto-Indo-European roots, MEI-1 and MEI-2 have a lot to do with um, the word Minoan, and it may may lead to something here. Um, one of the ideas that I saw in passing as I was putting this together that uh, um, the MEI root deals with uh, uh, Mithras, you know, and Mithras is a, a libido uh, character as well, though, too, you know what I mean? But it, it, it would say that we're dealing with the fullness of, uh, of how can I say this? The fullness of the, 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 the circuit of the psyche in the F-E-I-E-D-M situation, right? We're dealing with the fullness of that as being shown as uh, 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 being brought, be being pushed to, the, to the, the finish line, right? The fullness of that, the energy being pushed to the, full, the, the, the finish line, that the libido does that, all right? So, uh, and, and, and that Mithra's name is tied up in the idea of the Minoan Axe is something, all right? And I think uh, uh, Dr. Reza Giorgiani even talked about um, um, Mithras, Mithras uh, um, and, and the whole idea of, of, of libido, the, the whole idea of, of him being linked to Prometheus. Prometheus is mentioned in, 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 this, um, in this myth and story as well, though, too. So it's like when you see a lot of these characters being linked up, sometimes there are lines that connect them that are, are showing you, hey, they're talking about this type of thing in the psyche. Anyways, let's continue. Um, so Zeus orders someone to cleave his head open with a double-headed axe, the Minoan axe. Who was it? Before I go there, explore has now been covered in this story via this portion of the myth. All right. Some say it was Prometheus. And Prometheus means forethought, being able to look into the future. Some say some say it was the blacksmith Hephaestus. Some say it was Ares, the god of war. And these are all fire deities. I'm, I might just have to throw the fire chart back up there real quick so you can see where, where I'm getting at with all this. All fire de deities, by the way, which represent as fire, rebirth, creativity, intuition, vision, spirituality, and, re and rejuvenation. Let me go back a little bit, libido. And, uh, and when I just talk about sexual libido, the way that psyche is, is linked to things in order to, you know, do what it has to do with them to get things done. You know what I'm saying? Um, so let's continue forward. Lastly, but not but but most important. Lastly, but most importantly, they add Hermes to this list of those that might have used the axe to uh, to free Athena from the head of Zeus, who is the Egyptian Tahuti, Thoth, Mercurius of the Alchemists, who is the author of the work of transmutation and transformation, the healer and physician who is both poison and cure, who is also a trinity being one body composed of sun, which is male, animus, and moon, female, anima, as one, who also has the dual serpent for his symbol, amongst others. This suffices for divide, okay? And um, now, now, now we're gonna get to master coming up here in a second. A curative answer to a problem uh, uh, which is the, the, the divide idea. This is like a, a, a little extended understanding of that. The divide situation is a curative answer to a problem which betrays the idea of measurement and estimation because the divisor and dividend gives a quotient, okay? This is mathematics, which is not only a mathematical answer, but also a degree or amount of a specified quality or characteristic. By comparison to the idea of measurement and the inherent meaning of quotient, also the root of the word metis, the name of the god 
Zeus swallows, which is Metis, right, comes up with amplification power in the Proto-Indo-European root Me2. And I'm going to throw that up on the screen because it, it, it's like, it's it's insane. It's a, when I when I saw this, I was like, boom, I got, I got a brain gasm. Okay, so Me2 is to measure root of Metis, moon, geometry, gamatria, and many more are revealed. Many more words are revealed there. I'm going to throw them up there. That way you guys can check them out. Also, splitting of something via alchemical process is called separatio. Okay, and I'm going to throw that chart up there as well, though, too, so you can see what that divide process could further mean. All right. I will place the flow chart on the screen and you will or may again see how this explains the divide process. One more interesting finding in ancient Crete, the double axe was an important sacred symbol of the supposed Minoan religion. There in Crete, the double axe only accompanies female goddesses, never male gods. It seems to have been a symbol of the first principle of creation which in this case points to something more feminine as a curative for the male than the masculine remedy as present time theology has misled us to believe is the answer, okay? Zeus is basically being assisted by the same thing he tried to destroy. Such it is for us also that egotistically we look at the spiritual things, right? And spiritual is more hidden, so that's feminine, right? As worthless in this day and age, such, such it is in the war of the left against right. But we see now where salvation will arise when the time comes, all right? So master, the last portion of it equals Athena, goddess of wisdom handicraft, heroism, courage, war, which has been called war, which has been called the father of all things by Heraclitus, strategy, industry, and cities, all right, who springs from Zeus' head, fully grown and armed, prepared when she, uh, uh, when she was born. She was prepared when she was born, basically, so that, that, that idea that, that you come into when you have divided, after you have divided and you master, you make the choice to do something. The thing is, is you're going to see on, on the list, that, uh, the chart that I gave you is that uh, Athena's name is there where the serpentine or reptilian amygdala is, right? And she is also noted there where it says master. And this shows you the idea of the prima materia. Also, the fact, once again, and I'm going to say it again, that in the diamond archetype of the self of Carl Gustav Jung, the rotundum is linked to the superior homo, the uh, uh, the, the superior man. So you have the uh, uh, or what or what they call the anthropos. So what you have is the rotundum or or or, or the anthropus rotundum or uh, the round man, the whole man, okay, um, and, and this is one that that's it, that's integrated the use, the the ability to use their libido in a way that is uh, uh, is actually viable and doable. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> she springs from Zeus's head, fully grown and armed, prepared. When she was born, all the gods were awestruck, and even the sun god Helio stopped his chariot in the sky. The sky and earth shuddered before her appearance. When God, as Zeus, created the universe, it was stated that when he did this from Logos, his first thought was Athena, who is linked to the idea of Nous, the mind of God. Nous is a, a representative of the mind of God, as in she represents a higher or the highest anima figure, for example, Sophia, Sophonima, which uh, was the mother of Melchizedek, wisdom in the Proverbs, they, they refer to wisdom as a, a, a high anima aspect, and I, I might want to throw something on that up on the screen real fast, that way you guys can see that really quickly, and it is she being loosely referred to as the Ruach HaKodesh. In First Corinthians two sixteen, and the Ruach Hakodesh is the Holy Spirit, the mind of God. All right, 
And um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm pretty sure, shows you that that's what they're talking about. It's the Holy Spirit, all right? But they refer to it as nous, all right? So um, nous means mind, understanding, reason. Also see Romans 12, 2, and 3, which is the origin of receiving God slash self's thoughts through faith. It is nous um, that is linked to the word also lob in Hebrew, which equals 32, which is heart and mind. And there are 10 sephiroth in the Hebrew Kabbalah and 22 paths. That equals the number 32, a number of completion or wholeness. So we are at the, uh, the part of the story that represents master. And this is this idea that I just spoke to you about. If you were following along with me and you were looking at the chart, and trying to make reason of it out of what I was speaking to you, you're really gonna, you're really probably gonna come into some mind blowing ideas in this one. And if you understand the terminology, because there is a, a lot of a lot of little little terminologies in in in, in myths, in uh, uh, alchemical psychology, analytic psychology. That if, if you don't get the, the the little terminologies, you mess up something up somewhere along the way, and you kind of have to rehash the 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 go 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 back to the, the 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 drawing board again. You know what I mean? And the thing is, that's a beautiful thing because that's exactly what you're doing in the 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 whole path working of freeze, emotionalize, imagine, explore, divide and master you know you're going to continually go through that cycle the same thing with uh carl jung's uh diamond archetype of self as well though too you you continually go in back and forth with this thing throughout the whole circle but consistently if you're doing it consciously consistently rising on levels into higher states of being all right and mentality you know um so let me see if I can say anything about this chart before we go. So um, they're all all the all the portions of this are lined up in a very intelligible way that you will see here. Once again, remember for the lane that says triune brain all the way in the left, um, you're going to see base of, of the head. That's where the amygdala is. All right. And that deals with your freeze response, your emotional responses and stuff. That's the limbic system. All right. Um, imagine, imagination is thal thalamus. Oh, I was right. And neocortex. All right. Um, explore, divide, and master are the neofrontal cortex. And as, as you look down, the neofrontal cortex corresponds to ideas that are described by left brain um left brain function the amygdala limbic system um will will have a lot to do with the right brain function maybe a little bit less for the the thalamus and neocortex but you're going to notice that lane that says imagine there there is a lot of hidden things there if you will if you could understand how the left brain works, how the right brain works, you'll see that that is the direct middle. That is the narrow gate that I believe even the Bible speaks of. That is it. That is it. And 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 you want to you want to bring things in equilibrium enough to get into the center. That's why I put the key and the caduceus on the top of that and below it you see the the word serpent is there the serpent and it's it's you see the the mirror is there on one side you have something that's human on one side uh, uh you have something that is uh um serpentine especially if you look at the other mythological characters lane you have medusa the serpent all the way on the right you have um perseus which is human on a horizontal plane from that vertical plane that represents uh, uh imagine and the serpent for instance okay 
and, and, and keep in mind, we're comparing um, systems here, which is a cool thing to do. You know what I mean? It's really such a cool thing to do. And, and, and the thing is that you're going to see is that there's a dark and a light side. This is where light and dark is pretty much separated on this idea. Um, down, now talking about light and dark, you have the moon. So you have a lot of animus type ideas on the left side of this chart. You have the sun. You have a lot of anima sides. Uh, uh, I meant to say where you see the moon, you have anima ideas there. Where you see the sun, you have animus ideas that are intimated there as well, though, too. Um, let me see. So talking about the what we just went over with. Zeus's eating of Athena and Metis and how this is a, a very good way to even look at the structure of the triune brain, right? Athena um, and Metis, you see them entering the mouth of Zeus, the mouth of Zeus, right? Which is like you could say the mouth of God, right? Um... The logos is that which comes out of the mouth of God. We talked about news and how news is the one that speaks the symbols and words of God to the mind of man, who man is also a symbol if he has the right doctrine and how man becomes that uh, recipient. He becomes a magnet because he has the right doctrine, right? So um, basically... That, that, that is what that mouth is, you know. Um, there's a, a, a scripture about, let me see. I'm not going to stall out so long. I'm going to put it up here because it's going to come to me. I'm going to remember it. But man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. And it just came to me right now and and the thing is is this you can see if you're looking at this chart you can see exactly what i'm talking about how the in the gnostic idea that serpent noose was the one that relayed these messages from the father he got the symbols and relayed them to the son of man on earth and then from the son of man the symbol went back up to uh, news who gave it back to the father and then you know there was a consistent back and forth this is what's happening to those of us that are receiving the doctrine that have the doctrine and that can be called sons of God so um, that deals with the mouth of uh, of God there and then you're going towards uh, uh, and, and that's proceeding from the right brain now okay to the left brain um, that's going from the right brain portion, which is freeze, emotionalize, imagine, right? Into the portion that is saying explore, divide, and master. You have Zeus, and then what, what, what happens? When you're able to master something and you get, you get one of those, one of those uh, 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 um, overwhelming situations that happen when you come to a breakthrough experience, Athena is born from the cleft in the head of Zeus. That's what that uh, that, that that's what this whole thing is, is 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 showing it. So basically, basically you see Athena and Metis entering the mouth of Zeus. Zeus being perplexed, giving birth to wisdom through that chaotic time, through that perplexion, right? And then you also after that, when Athena is brought forth. It is scientium ex profundo, right? And that, that basically means knowing out of the depths, knowing, knowing or understanding by knowing from the depths. You know what I mean? And that's the depths are what? What, where, what is that? The rotundum. You know what I mean? Uh, um, the, the superior homo, the, the greater man, the higher man is akin to... Um, receiving a, a rapport with what they would call the higher animus figure and we talked about the four levels of anima development all right and, and we even talked about four levels of animus development and that that's that's dealing with uh, uh the master portion of 
this situation here. But uh, without without further ado, since we're at the hour mark, I wanted to keep this one short. And I told you guys that I would just basically be coming back on here to reinform you of uh, of uh, what I was talking about in the last video where I said that I would pop back on here and uh, talk about how uh, a certain myth has something to do with the triune brain theory and also get into something Dr. Jordan Peterson had to say about uh, the FEI, EDM or freeze, emotionalize, imagine, explore, divide and master idea based upon stimuli that comes or stimulus that you deal with and basically that that's that's how you're pushed through situations right um and i think i think i'm gonna leave it at that other than to uh uh ask you maybe if you want to do a little bit of homework check out the uh the myth of perseus check out the 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 whole the whole story it's a pretty short story and you also see how this situation goes there's a, a horse in that story Pegasus, who represents the libido, who is tamed by once again who Athena. So it, it this this whole chart links back into itself in a way. There, this is this is a very sound chart. Um, so I think I'm gonna leave it at that. There are a few footnotes that I think I'll read off to you before I go to because that would be beneficial because it's probably not gonna show up so well on the screen, um, the smaller writing. So uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. So where it says Perseus, it says uh, Her Hermes gave Perseus Hades helm of darkness and gave him winged, winged sandals. And uh, I also put in the lane where it says other mythological characters, Perseus and his sword given by Zeus. So why would a, a hero have all these different things because the thing is is like we're all given some know-how some knowledge some uh, abilities that allow us to explore imagine also to master certain situations to divide we're, we're all given certain innate equipment from certain uh uh, uh energy you could say we're given certain energy from certain deities or from certain symbolic things that are representative of those energies and we can take those energies and use them to just stay on the left side of the brain be a great person in society or we can use these tools to go into deeper portions of our psyche the right brain and rescue the Ethiopian princess, for instance, right? And in, like in the myth of Perseus, it says here, the Ethiopian princess has a lot to do with the Ethiopian that um, is, is, is being talked about in, I think it, it was the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, right? Um, I may put something up there on the screen about that as well, though, too. And, and, and that goes back to, um, levels of anima integration that we all need to do we we all need to free that really that diamond in the rough if you will that is inside of us that can actually be turned into and recognized for the initiatrix that athena per se is you know and for women women could get introduced to that initiator that is mercurious if should they do the animus work that is necessary right um and you you see that this did like like go, going into the bottom of of this of this chart uh it, it says lapis in that lane i was talking about the ethiopian princess she's tied to a rock because she's going to be fed to Cetus, who Perseus has to defeat. And Cetus is like, uh, is another chaos creature, you know? And, and the chaos creature, or even Medusa, is a negative anima form 
within the psyche, you know? You have individuals that just can't get anywhere in life. They're stuck in freeze mode because they're 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 they're, they're, they're stuck in certain aspects of of themselves. And I'm talking about the men in this lane dealing with Medusa. It's like they're they're they're, they're stuck on 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 some some levels, you know, with, with a devouring mother archetype. You know what I mean? They 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 need to do some work to free themselves out of the coils of of that. Uh, a suffocating serpent pretty much you know what i'm saying so um what else do i want to get into on this um okay let me read some of these other things um so the law inscription in the upper left hand corner that says triune brain the myth of zeus Metis, and athena sum up the triune brain that's in the lower left hand corner you'll see that footnote that's what i just read um the star that goes all the way under the other mythological characters portion where the story of perseus is kind of laid out there um we got what i wrote down there was pegasus would correspond to the libido running through the whole process who is birthed from the neck of medusa after it has been severed by perseus it is a th Athena who tames the libidinous, maternally symbolic Pegasus and gives him to Perseus so he can rescue Andromeda. So there's a formula in all of this that shows you how to free these things up in yourself. All it takes is what? A little bit of imagination. Don't be so hard-lined and so close-minded as to not allow yourself to not gift yourself the opportunity to be able to be imaginative enough to maybe just see that myth and symbology can open up some deeper understandings into your own personal life i mean there's an old saying that says and i'm gonna say the nice version if you want to hide something from a stupid person you put it in a book right and um I'll even go a little bit further to say that if you want to hide something from uh, the world and be able to put it right in front of their face, hide it through the, the guise of symbolism. Because nobody understands that anymore but those that put it out there and then everybody else that links themselves to it are, are stuck in a in, in, in participation on mystique because they don't understand what it means. They, 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 they're, they're receiving the energy off it. They're receiving the power of the symbol, but they don't know what it means, you know? And, and, and then even how much more after the structure of those symbols break down for them, you know, when they do find out what the symbols mean, how much more then, how much more sweeter would even those things that you've stopped doing become? Like uh, uh, for me, Christianity, went down the toilet for me a long time ago, you know, being uh, uh, um, kicked out of church. Uh, I was actually formally excommunicated. I, I talked about that. I did a, when I was younger, I did, a, I got a little bit of time. I, I, I basically did a uh, book report with a friend of mine on uh, the subject of Egyptology. We, we, we kind of went overboard with some of the the, the things that happened, it was, it, you know, all in all, it was a nice, I think it was a nice report that we did. And it was a nice representation of, of a sarcophagus and of a mummy, a mummified body. Like, you know, the, the way that we, that we put everything together, like we put a lot of thought into it, but because it was a Christian church school, they decided to kick us out, you know? Um, and that kind of caused, you know, that and some other things that had happened down the line in churches with me kind of caused me to, to not even want to go anywhere near the Bible or read the Bible. But, uh, now at this point in my life, I absolutely 100% love, uh, the Bible scripture and the, the symbolic ideas that are, that are just innate in there, like, and the way that it speaks to me, you know what I mean? Um, the Bible and all other religious literature, you know, uh, because of the way that symbol speaks to me because I understand the symbol, you know, the, the thing is, is once again, 
the the magnetism you're you're a tuning rod you're a divine tuning rod you're you're a divine magnet what you really are is 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 wrapped around magnetism and you're being pulled towards the completion of a full work but you can you, you you'll get there who knows how long it's going to take but you can speed up your getting there you can catalyze that and i love using that word from um from um I want to say biophysics, uh, the, the, the way that they use catalysts uh, on certain enzymes and uh, make products, you know, they, they, they turn certain things into, into certain things that would take years and years and years to do naturally you know uh, they, they they speed up the process thousands and thousands of times is the same thing that happens in in winemaking but what's that that's alchemy you know um so yeah it's biochemistry biochemistry i think if i'm not mistaken but if i am don't hold don't hold me to it too too roughly because it is 209 a.m and uh i think we're done here uh, I hope you've been blessed and enriched by uh, this last little installation that is uh, kind of a kind of a, a, a informative to uh, and, and 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 a fulfillment of my word on what I said I was going to revisit uh, pertaining to the last video, and I hope you've been enriched by it because we all really need to get a set of tools, if you will, that we can utilize to. Uh, uh, forge a path in front of us because we're all and, and that's if we're trying to do do any of the work you know we're all trying to hack our way and make a, a path through the jungle through the forest if you will and those are those are symbols of the unconscious you know and if you don't have the tools you can't you can't make it to the center of the jungle or the center of the forest and get the gold ring, which is a symbol of yourself. You can't you can't really link yourself back to yourself. And that's uh, at the end of the day, truthfully, my only hope is to be able to give you some inkling of an understanding of how to get back to that uh, and, and how to live more of an abundant life through that type of knowledge you know um that's what i endeavor to do every day i, I stick i keep sticking my nose in books i keep uh, uh, uh um myself meditating on, on things of this nature day upon day because it, it, it there, there's nothing there's nothing in life better than it all right so the lecture is pretty much over at this point however if you want to hear something else that will concrete more of this information just stick around for a minute and it will, and it will come from egyptology and uh just sit and listen because i'm going to equate it to the map or the chart that i put out here earlier in this lecture and it, it could be very profitable to just hear another story i could have given the one of perseus andromeda and Medusa. However, I chose to do this one because I don't really approach too much Egyptology here on this channel. I throw a little bit in here and I throw a little bit in there, but I think that this uh, quick story will be enticing, illuminating, and worth the time because it approaches the idea of the Eye of Horus or uh, the Eye of Ra as well too, okay? Uh, which deals with consciousness and um, alarmingly it is in the shape of the triune brain it is in the shape of the brain structure in and of itself which I'll throw a picture up of in order to um, help you to see what's being talked about here in this portion but I'm going to do this quickly and just read to you something that I prepared earlier today okay so the Egyptians often referred to the sun and the moon as the eyes of particular gods. The right eye of the god Horus, for instance, was equated with the sun and his left eye equated with the moon. At times, the Egyptians called the lunar eye the eye of Horus and called the solar eye the eye of Ra. 
Ra being the preeminent sun god in ancient Egyptian religion. Both eyes were represented by the Wajat symbol, a, st a stylized human eye with the facial markings of the falcon that signified Horus. And that falcon represents something that's able to see at the top of dominance hierarchies. Jordan Peterson had, had said that at one time, and it uh, represents, you know, being able to see everything from a high vantage point, okay? The solar eye's volatile nature can make her difficult even for her master to control. In the myth of the distant goddess, a motif with several variants that may be descended from the story of the Book of the Heavenly Cow, the eye goddess becomes upset with Ra and runs away from him. In some versions, the provocation for her anger seems to be her replacement with the new eye after the search for Shu and Tefnut, but in others, her rebellion seems to take place after the world is fully formed. With the solar eye gone, Ra is vulnerable to his enemies and bereft of a large part of his power. The eye's absence and Ra's weakened state may be a mythological reference to solar eclipses and maybe something else, as uh, we'll come to find here. Meanwhile, the eye wanders in a distant land, Nubia, Libya, or Punt. She takes the form of a wild feline as dangerous and uncontrolled as the forces of chaos that she is meant to subdue. To restore her, one of the gods goes out to retrieve her. In another version known from scattered illusions, the warrior god Anhur searches for the eye, which takes the form of the goddess Mahit, using his skills as a hunter. In other accounts, it is Shu who searches for Tefnut who in this case represents the eye rather than an independent deity. Thoth, who often serves as the messenger and conciliator in Egyptian pantheon, can also seek the wandering goddess. We talked about him earlier in this lecture. His role is retrieving the eye of Ra. In his role in retrieving the eye of Ra parallels his role in the Osiris myth in which he heals or returns Horus's lost eye. In a late period papyrus dubbed the myth of the eye of the sun thoth persuades the eye of ra to return through a combination of lectures enticement and entertaining stories his efforts are not uniformly successful at one point the goddess is so enraged by thoth's words that she transforms from a re relatively benign cat into a fire-breathing lioness making thoth jump now if we look at the eyes of Ra or the eye, the eye of Horus, as the brain, okay, or as your consciousness. For most people, they don't want to hear this type of stuff, and yes, it will make them angry, like a fire-breathing lion. You know what I mean? People, a lot of people don't want to stay, sit, and listen to sound wisdom nowadays. And it's been statistically proven that the average attention span of a human being is less than that of a goldfish that's really important to keep in mind but at the end of the day we have to take our own consciousness our own soul our own life into our own hands so the only way we can do that and actually a catalyzed way using the word again is through the understanding of myth and the understanding of symbols and really diving into texts like this to extract some real meaning that can change our lives so continuing on when the goddess is at, l at last placated, the retrieving god escorts her back to Egypt. Her return marks the beginning of the inundation, which is a flood of the Nile, right? And the new year. So her return, the returning of the mind uh, represents the flood. And the flood is also akin to baptism and represents the new year, the coming of a new age, the dawning of a new time. We see that with uh, every new year that we have here because that's a celebration to uh, Janus, the god of thresholds. OK, Joachim Friedrich Quack points out that when Sirius reappears in the sky, it first appears reddish before turning blue, white. And he suggests the Egyptians connected this change in color with the pacification of the eye goddess, the pacified deity is once more a procreative consort for the sun god, or in some versions of the story, for the god who brings her back. Mahit becomes the consort of Anhur. Tefnut is paired with Shu. And Thoth's spouse is sometimes Nehemtawi, a minor goddess associated with this pacified form of the eye. And keep in mind, Thoth can be an animus figure, 
and Nehemtawi, a minor goddess, could be an anima figure. So we have uh, both male portions of, of the side uh, of this story, um, male. Uh, uh, a male consciousness in relation to anima and female consciousness in relation to animus, okay? In many cases, the eye goddess in her concert pr then produce a divine child who becomes the new sun god. And um, that's a product of the conjunctio and um, uh, a revivification of the libido that brings about the new birth or the child of the philosophers, if you will. The goddess transformation from hostile to peaceful is a key step in the renewal of the sun god and the kingship that he represents. Because it's a sun god, we're dealing with libido as well. Again, I will remind. The dual nature of the eye goddess shows, as Grave Browns puts it, that Egyptians saw a double nature to the feminine, which encompassed both extreme passions of fury and love. The Hebrews did as well because Gebura is a feminine potency on the tree of life but it's akin to mars and they even call women in hebrew uh when you want to call a woman missus is geboret and the, the root is gabura strong the same view of femininity is found in texts describing human women such as the instruction of anxie shank which says a man's wife is like a cat when he can keep her happy and like a lioness when he cannot this all is referenced because even as this picture shows, the shape of the eye intimates the brain anatomy and can easily be identified in the triune brain system. Remember, even amygdala means almond-shaped. The eyebrow would be the neocortex, the almond-shaped eye, the limbic center, and the line extending below and towards the rear eye that ends in a curl or spiral represents the reptilian brain center. The myth just recounts uh, just recounted can be seen as this. Mahit sounds like Metis in a way. The wayward and wandering eye of Ra who becomes Mahit is the mind in its lower states of animus and anima development, right? Following its own whims, following the autonomous impulses of the ego, we see that something higher than us, which is localized within us and without then, is dependent upon our cooperation. Also, Mahit could just as well represent the full moon, a symbol of the unconscious. Her return to her proper place could thus represent the restoration of the eye of Horus, a symbol of the moon, and of the divine order of the cosmos. Toby Wilkinson, an, e uh, an English Egyptologist, says that in early dynastic times, she may have been a protector goddess associated with holy places and her whose name means bringer back of the distant one, is the libido and the way it is constantly moving toward the point of pushing consciousness to an enlightened and more aware state. It is upon taking up the actions towards sufficiently satisfying the objectives of the motifs that are found within the hero's journey that Ra's issues, the losing of his eye, being able, unable to see, being blind, are resolved. The warrior god Enhur searches for the eye, which takes the form of the goddess Mahit, using his skills as a hunter, which, being a hunter, is a limbic brain attribute mixed with an attribute of the serpent or reptilian brain center. Enhur, who succeeds in bringing the eye of Ra back to him, becomes a pair with Mahit, for example, Animus and Anima join, and they produce a child in some version of the myth. And that is the child of the, of the philosophers. That's the philosopher's stone. This betrothal and childbirth brought about by Anhur and Mahit, Mahit is the conjunctio, the goal of the alchemical opus, the great work. Thoth or Tehuti, who often serves as a messenger and conciliator in the Egyptian pantheon, can also seek the wandering goddess. Thoth is the Egyptian version of Mer Mercurius slash Hermes, as I spoke of earlier in this lecture, the author and finisher of the alchemical work. Thoth in another version of the story persuades the Eye of Ra to return through a combination of lectures, enticement, and entertaining stories, much like I am endeavoring to do here for all of you. His efforts are not uniformly successful. At one point, the goddess is so enraged by Thoth's words that she transforms from a relatively benign cat into a fire-breathing lioness, making Thoth jump. And it is almost as if 
bold action towards social work slash activism does much better than speaking and artful demonstration towards accomplishing the same ends as if actions speak louder than words but both will actually suffice the goal so um that's it right there and maybe you can see from the whole situation that you will come to see how this whole situation will link to actually coming into an understanding that what you just saw that I put up on the screen is the picture of the the whole triune brain series right there once again this is another myth that uncovers that so once again that will be all for the Egyptian side of this blessings to one and all thank you for uh, sharing this time with me and for uh, being part of my journey I hope I am a, a, a big, meaningful, and important part of your journey in this life and in the walk towards self-awareness and wholeness. With that, have a good rest of your night and morning or whatever it actually is on whatever hemisphere of the planet you are.